probabilistic uh, AI. And uh, the talk will be given uh, by uh, our guest and my uh, boss, uh, uh, Alto Klami from University of Helsinki. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, you can hear me, right? Excellent. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to teach or lecture for such a huge audience. Uh, I intentionally did not check what's the material that you covered yesterday, uh, so that I wouldn't rely too much on that. So I'm going to start from very basics of Bayesian inference as a recap, mostly to just also introduce the notation that I'm going to use. Uh, I'm not going to give a very hands-on talk. Instead, I really talk about the fundamentals, the algorithms, the definitions, and in the afternoons, I, I presume you'll be working more towards how you actually build concrete uh, algorithms. Uh, first, very briefly about myself. So I come from Finland, University of Helsinki, uh, where I'm an assistant professor of uh, computer science and data science. Uh, got my PhD from Aalto University, also in Finland, uh, roughly a decade ago. Uh, I have my research group that's called Multi-Source Probability Inference, just for the funny acronym. Uh, it has two terms, probabilistic inference, so I really to work, work with uh, probabilistic modeling. Uh, and multi-source refers to all kinds of learning problems where we're integrating multiple types of data. So some sort of multi-view learning, multi-task learning. Uh, all kinds of slightly more advanced learning topics. My background is really in kind of core statistical machine learning research. Uh, I've been doing that for 20 years, uh, focusing on approximate uh, inference techniques and covering a lot of applications uh, ranging from computational biology to computational neuroscience, uh, physics, uh, lots of kind of NLP type of applications. And uh, I would also like to mention uh, a newly established uh, research center called Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence. It was established last year as kind of a hub of AI research in, in Finland. Uh, and my role there is uh, to work towards something we call agile probabilistic AI. Which means that we are essentially talking about ways of making Bayesian machine learning solutions practical, easy to use for everyone, so that it's actually cheaper for, let's say, companies to build uh, AI solutions that actually can handle uncertainty, so that the one who's developing the tools doesn't really need to be a PhD, has to have a PhD in statistics, uh, and that they are reliable and, and easy to use. So, FKIN is the hub that is going to generate lots and lots of nice new research uh, related to these fields. Uh, I started wondering why I'm here uh, talking about various non inference in particular, and took a look at what I've been doing in this topic. Uh, I was myself a bit surprised to find something in the ballpark of 15 papers that are about various non inference or applications of it. Uh, the main things I've done are uh, various non approximations for these kind of multi view learning setups, canonical correlation analysis and its extensions uh, in the battery factor analysis and group factor analysis, uh, all kinds of matrix factorization setups, uh, but then also more generally, I've done various non approximations for topic models, uh, for approximations over permutations to be used for object matching. Lots of research on uh, non-conjugate models. So we will be talking about non-conjugate models uh, later today. Uh, and in the recent years, I've been focusing more on the core algorithms for, for various non-inference, so trying to make them more efficient. Uh, and also very recently with Thomas, who introduced me, uh, about how do you do inference when you already know in advance what you're going to use the model for? So integrating Bayesian decision theory uh, into the problem of approximate inference. I'm not going to say anything about these more advanced topics, but I'm happy to talk about them uh, during the breaks and, and, and evenings. But so today, 
what we go through is really the fundamentals of variational approximation, what I call classical variational inference, the things we used to do until roughly 2014. It means that we are converting the task of optimal, the Bayesian inference, so solving for the posterior distribution into an optimization problem, making a lot of simplifying assumptions about the model and about the approximation, and then deriving nice analytic update rules for solving the problem, which is very nice. It's very elegant theory, something that you can really... I, I worked with that kind of stuff for, for a decade. Uh, the problem is that it has very limited scope. It really doesn't help you with very flexible models that we would want to use for practical applications. And tomorrow, uh, we will then go to the kind of recent advances that what have been, happened in the field of variational approximations that makes it possible today to kind of learn these approximations for much, much wider family of models uh, Essentially building a lot of techniques that are being kind of co-developed with the deep learning community. So we're talking about stochastic optimization, uh, a lot of Monte Carlo approximations for various kinds of integrals. integrals. Uh, so this is kind of split. So now I'm talking about historical stuff from uh, late 90s to 2015, and tomorrow for about the last few years. Uh, most of what I say today can be found in a very, one single paper by Bly and others two years ago. Uh, that says uh, very science for us, a review for statisticians. So if you're not a statistician, it might be slightly tricky to read. So if you come with a computer science background, then my lectures are hopefully slightly easier to follow. Uh, if you are a statistician, then I am skipping a lot of the statistical rigor, so you better consult this paper and just read that. You can probably read it in less than two hours, so I do cover a bit of other stuff as well. Okay, uh, but let's start from, before we talk about what variational approximation is, let's talk about the question of Bayesian inference. So you should already know about this. I just want to show this to get the notation right. Uh, I'm all the time presenting things in a very abstract manner. So I just say there's some data. I represent my data with individual data record with an X, and then have this P to denote for the whole data set. Implicitly, I'm assuming that you're all the time talking about IID data. Uh, a lot of these techniques, of course, do generalize to other types of uh, data structures as well, but we're not going to that kind of details anyway. Then I have a parameter vector theta, maybe of very high dimensionality, may consist of very different types of parameters, maybe some of them are discrete, some of them are continuous, but I denote all of them with this use vector. If you have matrix form parameters, just think of them as vectorized format or whatever. It's just an abstract notion of all the parameters. And then we have the model specification. We have a prior distribution over the parameters, and we have the likelihood that tells what is still a kind of probability of observing a certain specific data instance given the parameters. So we're talking about parameter models, uh, and I'm all the time just writing this generic notation. We have a likelihood and we have a prior, and I'm not really focusing on what is the functional form of and given this kind of formulation, which is expressed by the joint likelihood, joint uh, probability of the data and the prior, uh, what we want to do is solve various kinds of problems. We might want to make predictions. We don't know the parameters, but we've observed some sort of data. We would want to see what is the probability distribution of future observations coming from the same process. We might want to solve decision problems. You've observed all of your data, you know something about the parameters, and now you want to make an action. The value, the utility of your action, depends on what you do, and what is the state of the world. What is the true parameter? And we would want to make rational decisions, meaning that we want to somehow maximize our expected utility 
over all the possible choices that the parameters could take. Or, of course, we could simply be interested in the specific choice of the parameters. So let's say if our model corresponds to some physical process, this parameter might, might be of a kind of real direct interest for us. We want to know what is the effect of doing this and that. And then we say that, okay, the effect is that uh, something grows by 3%. And we would want to know what is the probability distribution of this effect. So this is really pretty much the kind of thing that we are talking about. Uh, and the, at the core of these, all of these questions, irrespective of what problem we are solving, pretty much the first thing we need to do is to figure out what is the posterior distribution. So the distribution of the parameters given the data that we've observed. So if you look at here, it appears here inside this integral, so we're computing some sort of an expectation over this posterior distribution. And the posterior distribution, we get it by the Bayes rule. So is there anyone in the audience who doesn't know the Bayes rule? Good. Uh, I <laughs> hope so. Uh, so it's a simple algebraic manipulation of probability density. So just take the choice density and divide it by the marginal likelihood. So the probability of the data, conditional on your assumed model, but integrating out all the parameters. Uh, and this is the challenging part. So if theta is, let's say, a thousand-dimensional uh, parameter vector, then this is an integral over a thousand-dimensional space, over some probability distribution for theta. You kind of, probably all of you know how to do manual analytic integration of simple one-dimensional functions. Even there, you quickly run into trouble if you have a very complicated expression. You can do numerical integration in one, two, three, maybe four dimensions, but not in a thousand dimensional space. So this is an unknown quantity for us. We simply don't know what the value is. Anyway, the goal here is that if we solve this posterior distribution, then we can solve all the other problems in the world. Not quite. Some of them might be tricky, but I'm not talking about them today. <laughs> So this is the, the goal is that if we are able to figure out the posterior, then we know roughly how to proceed. Then we start working with, let's say, a decision problem that sti still involves an integral over this probability distribution. But let's assume for a type being that they are easy. Uh, anyway, let's say the Bayesian decision theory says that knowing the posterior is sufficient information for unrequired information for making the optimal decisions. So we need to do this first. Uh, and this is, I think, is a good starting point to start talking about optimization. So the title of the talk was Various and Inference and Optimization. Uh, and before we go there, it's good to realize that phase and inference is not an optimization problem. Most of the other things in machine learning, if you think about supervised classification, uh, evolutionary algorithms for optimizing some sort of structures, uh, most of the unsupervised things, they're formulated in some sort of an optimization problem. You have an objective, and you try to do as well as you can with respect to that objective. There's an inference is not that. <coughs> we just have a closed form expression the Bayes rule. It's just computation. You plug in your model, you plug in your prior, and you apply this rule. So in principle, there's nothing to optimize for. It's just standard math. The problem is that we only can do this in a closed form exactly in very simplified cases. Let's say for discrete parameters, the integral here for the marginal likelihood becomes a sum. You simply sum over all possible values of theta and just compute this expression. Then you can easily compute the posterior as well. Of course, if the dimensionality is 1,000, and then let's say you have binary variables, you have 2 to the power of 1,000 uh, terms to sum over, 
So it's still hard to compute in all practical cases. Things like Bayes networks, the Bayes nets, are designed for expressing these conditional independencies so that this different summation would become feasible. It can be done up to a few dimensions, uh, kind of without trouble. There's other easy cases as well. Uh, one special case is the exponential family. So how many of you know what an exponential family is? Did you cover that yesterday? No? Okay, not too many. I'm going to tell you later today that what this exponential family of distributions is. Uh, I presume that for statisticians, it's much more familiar than for computer scientists. Uh, <coughs> if you ever want to work with various and other approximations, you probably need to learn what exponential families are. They help things a lot. Uh, in particular, so exponential family is a way of expressing a very wide range of probability distributions in such a manner that there is uh, easy ways of converting priors to posteriors with simple algebraic calculations without ever needing to compute these integrals. But it only holds for the models that we can express uh, uh, in specific format. And of course, you can simply try out to compute the integral. The integral that you have here, just compute it uh, in analytic computation. So here's actually an example of how, can you, how you do Bayesian inference. Let's start with a very simple model. So you have a, I can actually, let's try to use this. So you have a prior, some probability distribution for a single parameter that just is somewhere close to zero. And then what you do is that you observe one data point from a normal distribution with the mean given by the parameter and then a known constant variance. And now the quest goal is to compute the posterior distribution of this parameter given the data. So we see if there, the correct answer is there on the bottom of the slide. And if you just take a look at the straightforward direct computation of this, so the first thing is to write the joint likelihood. The marginal likelihood is the integral of the joint likelihood with respect to theta. So the thing we need to do is simply write the joint likelihood. It's given here. It's just the product of the two normal distributions. I do hope that you remember what is the PDF of a normal distribution. If not, then just look it up in Wikipedia. You complete the squares to get the next expression. That's a bit of algebraic manipulation, something you probably learned during the first bachelor courses in, in math. Probably could do already in high school if you put a bit of an effort. Uh, the critical thing is that around here, we have something that depends on theta and some other parts that do not. We don't need it. Let's just take them out. Uh, and mark all of the terms that do not depend on theta by cx, c of x. Um, it's just some function. We do know what the form is. We can take a look at it e to the power of minus one fourth of x squared divided by two pi, but we don't need to worry about it. If we now look at what is the marginal likelihood, the integral of this joint density with respect to theta, you get a simple result by simply noting that this e to the power of minus half tau blah 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 is a normal distribution without its normalizing <coughs> So the integral of this with respect to theta has to be inverse of the normalizing constant. And now, finally to compute the posterior distribution, we just take the joint likelihood that is given here, divided by this, the marginal likelihood to get uh, what we have at the bottom. The C of x cancels out. It's nice. It, it's the part that was not a function of theta, so it doesn't matter whether we integrate it over theta or not. And then in the end, we do have the posterior. We get a posterior that says, 
Yeah, well, it is a normal distribution. With mean given by exactly half of our data point, which is natural. Our mean was zero, and then we observed some x, let's say four. Then the posterior mean is at two. And then the variance that was one for both of the likelihood and the prior, it has decreased to half. So we have a variance of one over two. So precision is just the inverse of variance. I occasionally use precision just to simplify the equations. So this is the basic procedure of Bayesian inference. This is a one-parameter model with one data point. So we can do this integral analytically in closed form, but it's still not trivial. I mean, you have to do this completing the squares to get it in the right format, and then you have to realize that you're computing an integral, the value of which we know because we recognize it as the unnormalized PDF of a normal distribution. So this is the kind of typical, typical math exercise you would do on a kind of a statistics 101. You're supposed to be able to carry these things out, but anything more complex than this gets very tedious. Two to three parameters, some simple probability distributions, you can probably do it. If I put an exercise problem of, uh, let's say, there's this five-parameter model with these couple of PDFs, and I ask all of you to solve it, then let's say in 15 minutes a couple of you might have it correct. For the rest of you, in some of you it might take a couple of hours or days, and you will still have mistakes there. So it's a very tedious process, which we don't want to do in this kind of closed form computation. And so in this example only because I later showed that in this exponential family, things get slightly easier. Uh, the point of Bayesian, the actual practical techniques for Bayesian inference is that we don't need to solve for the posterior distribution in analytic closed form to be able to solve the actual problems that we care about. Whether we're talking about solving a decision problem or making predictions, in the end what we talk about is computing expectations. So I'm going to use this uh, weird E to denote an expectation with respect to its subscript. So expectation uh, with respect to the posterior distribution of some function of our parameters, the function f. And we can use something called the Monte Carlo approximation to compute such expectations. And the Monte Carlo approximation is a very simple technique. So if you have an expectation like this, what you do is that you draw a sequence of samples indicated by theta m from this distribution with some algorithm. It doesn't matter yet what the algorithm is. You just sample data from your distribution. You hope that you're able to do this right. Let's say if your distribution is a normal distribution, you of course know how to sample from this distribution. In R, you would write something like R norm. You just sample uh, values from this distribution. And the expectation itself is approximated by computing the value of the function for every single theta m and taking an average of them. This is very easy. So whenever, let's say, you have a code that has a function and it takes as an input, you just put in place of the input a large collection of random numbers drawn from the probability distribution and take a mean of them. It's a one-liner expression in any programming language. Uh, the problem, of course, is that if we don't know the posterior distribution, we usually don't know how to draw samples from it either. Uh, this is where Markov chain Monte Carlo comes to a rescue. It's an algorithm that without requiring you to know the posterior distribution itself, is guaranteed, as totally, to produce these samples from the correct distribution with some sort of a sequential algorithm. So this is an example illustration of the very standard Metropolis Hastings sampler that starts from somewhere and it always modifies the number uh, a bit according to certain rules. 
it kind of goes along here and always keeps a memory of all the samples that we have drawn from the distribution. After running for this for a long enough time, what you have is a collection of this theta n. Samples drawn from the posterior distribution, assuming you implemented it correctly and sampled for long enough time and so on. This is kind of the standard solution for Bayesian inference. You pick up an MCMC algorithm, you have a wide range of choices to make, and then you sample some, you obtain samples from your posterior distribution without computing it in closed form, and then given these samples, you can compute any expectation you want. So we're not talking about MCMC anymore, any further on, on, during these lectures. But this is the kind of just to remind you of the basic procedure of how do you usually do Bayesian. What we will be talking about is replacing the whole MCMC approach with an optimization algorithm. Uh, to motivate towards this, so if you think about what an MCMC algorithm does, uh, it is providing you samples from the posterior distribution, but it's very hard to tell how well is it doing. You can, of course, take a look at any of the papers explaining a specific MCMC algorithm. It has a lot of nice asymptotic properties. It is probably unbiased. It can kind of cover the whole area in a, some sort of a infinite time and so on. But in the end, what it does is that the relationship between the algorithm and the quality of our actual solution, of how well we can estimate the expectation we want to compute, it's very implicit. What you do is that you run your MCMC algorithm long enough, you carry out some diagnostics to figure out whether it's producing samples from the correct distribution and so on. It's just do it. It's just trying to do it as well as we can. Uh, for a computer scientist, that's kind of a weird starting point. Uh, if we learn to work with optimization algorithms, we might just want to instead have a clear objective that tells us are we doing well? And then if we have this objective, we would rather want to solve for, let's do it as well as we can. And really the idea here is that the idea of variational approximation and some other techniques that I, I'm not talking about is to solve the Bayesian inference problem with optimization. Instead of MCMC, we want to be able to use some sort of optimization algorithm to solve the problem. And the basic idea is relatively <coughs> simple. So here, black is our posterior distribution, and what we want to do is that we want to find another distribution, some parametric distribution, Q, parameterized by lambda, so it's a distribution over theta, and it has its own parameters, here, mean, and covariance, and we want to adapt this approximation until it looks like the posterior. If we can do this, then what we have is a solution that says this Q of theta, parameterized by lambda, looks almost like our posterior, and this Q is something that we chose. It's a parametric distribution. We have full access. We know what it is. Then, if we want to compute these expectations, we can just draw samples from this Q. If Q is simple enough, we might be able to compute these expectations in closed form. So this is the basic idea. Get rid of MCMC that just produces your sequence of samples. Instead, find, an find a probability distribution in a closed form that approximates your posterior as well as we can. The animation already gives a hint, In most of the times we don't get it correct fully right. So here, for example, we are approximating a kind of a Gaussian distribution with some correlation, a negative correlation between two axes, with a distribution that doesn't allow for correlations. So it's never going to be exact 
even at the optimal solution, it's still an approximate solution to our problem, as it will be in all practical cases that we're doing these things for, but it's still a reasonable approximation. Looks very similar. Uh, I already motivated this kind of very, very loosely by saying that the MCMC doesn't come up with guarantees. Uh, a lot of statisticians would probably disagree here. MCMC algorithms are very practical tools. For most of the, let's say, parameter inference problems where you really want to know what is the posterior distribution of this parameter, I would usually suggest go with MCMC. It is kind of the gold standard of obtaining the most theory as well as you can. But there are lots of good reasons to work with this optimization-based uh, variation approximation as well. Well, first of all, it's usually much more computationally efficient. We can, let's say, get rid of one or two orders of magnitude of computational cost. We do have an objective that is easy and nice to analyze. So it's, for example, much easier to debug your code. You have an objective function that is going to decrease during optimization, whereas debugging NCMC algorithms is extremely difficult. Uh, the solution, in the simplest cases, in everything that we talk today, is a deterministic solution. It's nice. If you have a pipeline, let's say you're working in a company that needs to do Bayesian inference, uh, as a routine that is every night it's being trained on some sort of data, it needs to be reproducible, it needs to be easy to kind of understand, so you would want to have a deterministic solution. Instead of an MCMC chain that during one of the nights it converts it badly, and then during that day all of the predictions that your company is doing are going wrong. Uh, and this kind of also relates to the, that if you have an existing pipeline, Let's say you're already working with a maximum likelihood solution for some sort of a classification problem. Uh, if you replace that with MCMC, you're going to end up replacing a lot of other parts in your pipeline as well. The solution is not a specific parameter value, it's going to be a collection of samples drawn from the posterior. If you replace it with the various on approximation, you still have a nice set of actual concrete parameters that you could, for example, visualize the same kinds of tools that you used for your point estimates. Uh, so, variation on inference, in brief, is one solution of handling uh, Bayesian inference with optimization. It's not the only one. Uh, you've probably heard of things like expectation propagation. It's simply another uh, approach uh, that is very closely related. I decided not to try to cover uh, expectation propagation during these lectures, just to keep the kind of amount of new stuff uh, down. But if you familiar, if you are familiar with the technique, then it's another approach of using optimization to solve these, these kind of problems. Uh, but before we can actually talk about the concrete, practical variation approximation algorithms, we need to take a look at some of these preliminaries that you might or might not be aware of. So the first thing is that we started by saying, let's take an approximation Q, take it to our posterior by minimizing some sort of a dissimilarity uh, measure. So let's first take a look at how do we measure distances between probability distributions. It's not quite the same as looking at Euclidean distance between, between parameter vectors. And then I will talk about this exponential family, or the specific parameterization probability distributions that will make our life easier. Uh, I'm covering it on a relatively shallow level, and I try to keep the rest of the lectures also on a level where you can follow everything that I say, even if you don't understand the exponential family. Every now and then I show things that are easier to do if you are working with the exponential family parameterization. Uh, if you struggle to understand what exponential family is, then they will not be easier for you. You can forget them. Uh, I will also use some of the theory for the exponential families to justify certain observations 
of, for example, why specific types of prior distributions are easy to handle. You can, if you struggle to understand this, you can just take it for granted. There's this magic theory that says, if this holds, then we can do like this. So don't worry if it uh, starts to look a bit mad heavy at that point. Uh, but before that, let's talk about distances. If you have two probability distributions, Q and P, I am saying that we will be measuring the similarity of these, the dissimilarity of these, between a specific measure called the kalpa kleibler divergence. It already hints at the bottom of the slide that this is definitely not the only possible distance measure you could imagine between probability distributions, but this is the one that we use in various lines. In classical variation on inference, uh, it has very nice properties. In particular, by choosing this measure, we will get very nice analytic algorithms that are easy to handle and compute. I will.
what I'm telling you is that it can be equivalently, completely equivalently, written in this format. Doesn't look more elegant, it doesn't look any simpler than the traditional one. This is only because you're used to working with the, the one above. There's nothing natural about parametrizing normal distributions with means and variances. In fact, the parametrization in exponential family is even called a natural parametrization. Uh, what it says is that instead of mean and uh, variance, you can parametrize this with a two-parameter vector called eta that has a direct, so this is simply a parameter vector. It has two elements. They are related to our the new and new and sigma parametrization that we are used to in a specific manner. And so it is here. What we have then that we take the dot product with that with something called the sufficient statistics, which is in this case it's the x itself and the square x squared. And finally, we have here something called the log partition function that is expressed as function of these natural parameters. And then we have some scaling term up front as well. Uh, if I gave you two minutes of time, you would be able to see that by simple algebraic manipulation, we would see that these are actually the exact same expression. If we start looking at things like uh, uh, the first element of eta times this, we get mu times x divided by sigma squared, and then if we take the second term here, we get essentially just minus x squared divided by 2 sigma squared, by completing the squares in a similar manner as we did in the earlier instance, we would see that they actually become exact <coughs> Um, this term, for example, it simply becomes mu squared. Uh, it becomes mu squared, and so on. Uh, you don't need to remember this by any means. I'm just saying that it is possible to write a normal distribution using this natural parametrization and the sufficient statistics. Uh, it doesn't look like easier, but why, why it matters is that, in fact, besides normal distribution, you can write almost all the distributions that you've ever heard of using the exact same expression. Not all of them, so you don't have, let's say, the t distribution here, you don't have, uh, well, there are others, but you have, let's say, for example, multivariate normal distributions. You have other multivariate distributions like Lewis Lane, and Wishart. You have all the standard ones, Bellui, Poisson, and Gamma distribution, and so on. And they are all expressed in this exact same form, only they come up with different sufficient statistics and a different log partition function. The natural parameters themselves, they are parameters, just like the mu and sigma are. Those define the specific uh, distribution you have within this family. But the log partition function and the sufficient statistics, once you have a specific functional format for those, then you define, you can have something that looks exactly the same. You don't need to worry about whether it's a normal distribution or a gamma distribution. There was a question somewhere, yeah. So, uh, you mentioned h depends on x, but on the right hand side? Uh, yes, h can depend on x. It actually, in this particular case, does not. Uh, but the important thing is that it does not depend on theta. Yes. Uh, if you want to know how you can express, let's say, an inverse gamma distribution uh, as an exponential family, distribution, 
I would say that the best source is the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia page for exponential family, it has a huge table that simply tells for a lot of distributions that what is the log partition function, what is the sufficient statistics for that particular. Uh, outside textbooks, I haven't seen a better collection of these. Uh, I would have put a picture here, but it was so wide table that I couldn't easily format it here. Maybe I should have put the link instead. But so there is a kind of reference. So if you want to write your model using exponential families, you just need to look at how to express any given uh, specific distribution in that form. So what we get out of this is that if you are writing a joint probability density of your model, that may have, let's say, you're assuming that your covariates follow normal distributions, your residual noise follows a gamma distribution, your, uh, you have a prior on your parameter vector with some specific type of log normal distribution, whatever. You have this joint probability density that is a collection of lots and lots of different kinds of probability densities. If you write everything in exponential family, you don't need any, let's say, uh, distribution-specific code in your implementation. Or at least you don't need it in the mathematical expressions you put in a scientific paper. No one will be able to read the paper if they don't know what an exponential family is, but you can write everything in a very nice condensed form. I myself struggled a lot with these papers early on during my PhD. I would see that there is this paper that presents everything in exponential family. But why are they doing this? Why are they making life so complicated for me? The reason is that I mean, you need this one expression instead of needing to write that for gamma we do this, for normal we do this, for log normal we do this. If you talk about algorithms, so much nicer to do one equation. The other thing is that there's actually very nice uh, identities and various kinds of tricks of computing a lot of properties of your distribution <coughs> in an unusual manner. For example, so we know, of course, that the mean of x for a normal distribution is just a parameter mean. We also, you might know, that the mean of x squared is mu squared plus sigma squared. You might know that or you might not know that. It's not the variance. The variance would be sigma squared, but the kind of uh, second moment of this distribution is, is really mu squared plus sigma squared. With exponential family, we have an identity that says the expected value of the sufficient statistic can be obtained by differentiating the uh, log partition function with this parameter eta. So I'm using the Nabla symbol here for, for the gradient with respect to eta. If you start differentiating this function, you will see that the expected value of these sufficient <coughs> statistics indeed is mu and then mu squared plus sigma squared. It's a simple algebraic derivation uh, that does okay. Just take this function and compute this derivative and out comes an expression that tells you not just the expected value of the data itself, the expected value of the uh, x squared in this case. Uh, the sufficient statistics have a meaning. It tells us all the information about your data that you will ever learn needs to define the distribution. So it tells that you, you know, even for example, if you're fitting some sort of a normal distribution, some, uh, some normal distribution to some data, you never need to store your data. You can store the mean and uh, you can store the ex, uh, sub expected sufficient statistics and that's it. How about the divergences? Between two distributions in an exponential family, they become Bregman divergences between the natural parameters. I'm not going to say anything about Bregman divergences, but the nice thing actually is that they are no longer integrals. You can compute them with derivatives and stuff. But we don't need that uh, today for it. So, if you have no idea what I talked about, just forget it. Uh, I will be using this form of an expression to denote for probability distributions. Just remember that eta is then some sort of a parameter vector. That is the one we are learning if I'm expressing a distribution. 
Okay. Uh, but this is the important property that you actually need to know about exponential families, which is something called uh, conjugacy or the kind of conjugate prime. So who knows what a conjugate prime is? Some of you. Uh, conjugate prior is a specific time, so given some sort of a probability distribution, this is now an exponential family distribution, don't need to worry about what it is. A conjugate prior, parallelized, parallelized by some uh, sign in, is any probability distribution that looks like this. There's some sort of a scaling factor that is not a function of eta, and then there is the simple e to the power of something expression. Uh, and by simple algebraic computation, so if you just take the product of these two things, similar to what we did earlier for the normal distributions, we see that the posterior distribution will be of the same parametric <coughs> form as the prior distribution was, and there is an easy way of manipulating the parameters. So you just take the prior parameter, Add the sufficient statistics of all of your data points, and that becomes the new parameter, right? And then for the other parameter, you add the number of observations. So all the tricky things we need with the normal distribution, this one parameter, simple example, we kind of get rid of them. We know that we can compute the posterior distribution in closed form, Assuming our model happens to have a prior distribution that is conjugate to this particular likelihood. So that whatever this is, it has to be in relationship to the specific likelihood. Uh, finally, let's take a look at the example in this way. This is either easier or not, depending on how well you really capture what is exponential family. Uh, our likelihood observing one data point with some parameter theta in exponential family we would simply write it like this. It's simpler than what I showed earlier because the variance is known. No need to figure out why it is exactly like this. So any prior that looks like this is a conjugate prior. <coughs> and now uh, the tricky part for us right now is to encode our original prior belief that there is a zero mean unit variance normal distribution for this theta. We need to write that in an exponential family to be able to see how do these parameters that we think about match to the natural parameters of this prior distribution. We can do that. Essentially, what we see is that to encode our earlier knowledge that there is a zero mean and unit variance as prior distribution like this, it actually corresponds to having zero here and one here. But now the computation is easy. You just take these parameters, add to them the observed data, and for the first one, so you update your parameters by taking this plus the observed data, so it becomes x, and this plus the number of data points that you've seen it becomes two. And then we see that if the result is the same as before. I would say that this is not necessarily easier than working directly with the integrals, but we got already rid of the integral. We just needed to express our prior belief in the right form. Yes, uh, I think this would be the right time for a short break. So the next thing we do is we actually go through variational approximation. So how long do we want to do? Uh, let's say five minutes break, I think that is easier than you don't have to listen to me throughout the day. <laughs> okay, it looks like almost everyone has finished this time. And uh, I didn't check how long this time to find this player, but I think it's more or less. Okay, so let's see. Let's go to the actual business of uh, what is a variational approximation and how do we compute it. Uh, 
So I already hinted earlier that the goal is to find uh, a problem of distribution Q over theta uh, that somehow matches the posterior. Uh, for most of the derivations, I'm dropping the parallel of the lambda just to give the equation strong, but it's good to remember that Q of theta is always parallelized by something. It's a probability distribution in a closed form. Uh, and like I said, we use the Calpert like the divergence from Q to the posterior. And the reason why we need to do it this way is that the Calpert like the divergence is an integral over the probability distribution. We choose Q. We can integrate over Q if we choose the student. There's no way of integrating over the posterior unless we've already solved our problem. So it has to be this way. And this way gives us an object. A loss function as a function of lambda, that is the KL divergence between Q and the posterior, and the goal is simply to minimize this with any sort of an op uh, optimization algorithm uh, we want to do. But unfortunately, we can't compute this either. Uh, we can integrate over Q if Q is certainly chosen. But the posterior still appears there. We don't know any numerical value on the posterior. But it's actually not that bad. <coughs> Let's do a very simple trick of uh, multiplying this expression by 1. Here, uh, the marginal likelihood divided by the marginal likelihood, so nothing happens there. Uh, what we have here is that this is, of course, just this. It's the joint distribution of the and the data. Uh, and, and here in the numerator we have... Uh, uh, so, so what we have now is we have the joint likelihood here in the denominator. It's, we can always compute that. It's an expression of our model. It's not the posterior that we can have. We have a numerical value for that. <coughs> In the numerator, we have the marginal likelihood. We can't compute it, but it's not a function of d, or d. It's not a function of d at all. So we've actually made a lot of progress even though we did nothing. Because the next thing we do is we simply take out the term that does not depend on d. The marginal likelihood is independent of d. It goes outside of the integral. It's also independent of lambda. So we don't really actually need to care about it. We cannot compute its value, but it's not really relevant for our optimization problem. So what I then did was uh, I just manipulated uh, well, the KL divergence in Q and the joint likelihood. It's not the posterior anymore. Now he is the joint likelihood. It's of course, it can be expressed in multiple ways. That's a still, that's a, I, I would hear one particular way of expressing it. Uh, just taking uh, the expectation of the joint likelihood over the approximation. There's a minus sign in front of it because the KL divergence has P uh, in the numerator. And then you have the minus. Minus entropy, it should be plus entropy, right? No, it's the minus entropy, yeah, so Q log Q, minus Q log Q is would be the entropy, and we have in the KL divergence, we have Q log Q, so there's a minus entropy coming from. So this is simply completely equivalent way of expressing the KL divergence. Uh, nothing miracles happening, it's just easier to look at these two things uh, in isolation, because it also gives us an interpretation. So now that we are solving this problem, what we are doing is looking at the negative expected log density over the approximation. So if we optimize for some sort of a Q to maximize this quantity, I minimize this quantity, what it means is that it's essentially the same as solving for maximum likelihood. It's a minus uh, the log likelihood which we minimize, so it's the same as maximizing likelihood. We're still integrating over our approximation, but for example, if our approximation was a delta distribution of some kind, we would just be maximizing the likelihood. It's also a reasonable thing to do. It's good to put the approximation where we have 
parameter values that are, have high prior probability and fit the data well. But then on top of that, what our loss function has is the negative entropy of the approximation. What it means that you cannot collapse your approximation to a delta distribution. You have to keep it wide somehow. So this is a you can think of it that we are doing maximum likelihood with the regularization that our uh, approximation has to be wide enough. And it follows directly from the KL diagnosis. There's no scaling terms uh, in front of this regularizer or anything. This is a thing that we could optimize for. We could try to minimize this loss function. The only thing is that we cannot actually compute this value. So the KL divergence itself is these terms plus the marginal likelihood which we don't know. That's actually a minor inconvenience. Uh, we cannot compute the value, but we can still improve it. Uh, we can convert it into a slightly more elegant uh, objective that doesn't have this problem. So instead of, of minimizing the KL divergence, what we can alternatively do is just rearrange the curves. Uh, let's say here we have the KL divergence is the KL divergence, the actual loss that we want to minimize is the marginal likelihood plus something. We just write it in and so that the marginal likelihood is this objective minus this something. Uh, <coughs> where we can alternatively, if we want to, write this in a slightly different manner as well. So I'm all the time actually jumping between the choice likelihood and then this kind of conditional uh, kind of likelihood times the prior based on convenience. It's good to remember that it's always completely equivalent. So what we have is that the marginal likelihood, logarithm of the marginal likelihood, actually is the expected log likelihood under our approximation minus Tail divergence between our approximation and the prior, plus then this tail divergence between our approximation and the posterior, the one that I said that we could be minimizing. But now, tail divergences are always positive. No matter how well we minimize it, the right hand side here, so the first two terms in the right hand side, are smaller than our actual marginal likelihood. Ah, sorry, larger. What am I going to do? And sorry, so tail divergence is always positive. So we have a positive term added to something. So if we, this, this other term here is always smaller than our marginal likelihood. So what it actually means is that usually variational approximation is formulated by maximization of a lower bound for the marginal likelihood. So these two terms here, they constitute a lower bound for the marginal likelihood. It always is a lower bound. If we reach the, we reach the marginal likelihood only when we have tail divergence between the approximation and the posterior being exactly zero then we actually manage to find a perfect number. For every other possible view, this quantity is smaller than the marginal likelihood. And what it consists of is the expected log likelihood and the divergence between the approximation and the prior. We can alternatively move around the prior and say that it's the expected joint likelihood minus, uh, plus the entropy of the these are completely equivalent, doesn't matter which way you do it. Doesn't actually matter for any of the algorithms either. And now this is a funny thing. This is finally an objective where all the terms can be computed on known parts of our model. So we got rid of the original formulation, the original tail divergence between the approximation and the posterior. That is nasty. We just used it to arrive at something that is lower bound in the marginal likelihood and only depends on terms that we can compute. So we have an expectation of the 
uh, likelihood of the data or the approximation, and then you have a measure of how well close the approximation is to the prior. Uh, this can be optimized, it can be evaluated, so this is what we do in very small approximation. It is still, however, very important to realize that comparing these lower bounds across different kinds of models or different kinds of approximation is not very sensitive. We know that this lower bound differs from the true uh, <laughs> marginal likelihood by an unknown quantity. It's the KL divergence that we were trying to originally minimize. So it's not a very good about comparison metric between different kinds of approximations. But we did one optimization <laughs> of the future. It's a well-defined learning objective that we can evaluate and we can optimize. So let's if we then talk about the algorithms. So we need to be able to evaluate this, which we achieve by making Q simple enough. We can choose Q, so let's choose simple enough so that we can do this. And then the question is how do we optimize for this? Today, we use coordinate ascent algorithm and close from analytic updates. Tomorrow, we talk about stochastic gradient descent for the solving this optimization problem. But we start from the same thing. It's the same lower bound that we are trying to uh, uh, in fact, for an optimization algorithm, you don't necessarily need to evaluate your objective. It's not a critical property. It's always a very good practice to do it, but it's not necessary. Let's say if you do gradient descent, you need to evaluate the gradient, and then you take a step. You always monitor the loss, but you don't need to. Uh, anyway, let's assume that we want to compute it. Uh, and, and the question is, what is this easy? We need to be able to compute an integral over Q. The Q is still a, it's still a B dimensional distribution if we have D parameters. And it's, it's a very nasty thing. So the thing inside, the joint likelihood of our data, or the conditional likelihood, uh, it's a scalar function. It's a simple function. It has a numerical value. But we still need to compute an integral over the dimensional space over an approximation that we choose. That's very nasty. Uh, in practice, what we do in almost every case is something called the mean field approximation. The name comes from, I think, physics somewhere. I don't really worry about that. What I mean by mean field approximation is that we assume that our joint density over the D parameters is actually created as a product of the one-dimensional uh, curves. So we're simply ignoring all the correlations between all the parameters in our model. I already showed an example of this earlier. I had this kind of uh, correlated posterior, and then I was taking an approximation with no correlations. So you can always find uh, a multivariate normal distribution with no correlations as a product of the marginal uh, normal distributions. And if we do it this way, then our, oh, here is a missing uh, Q of theta. Uh, the integral of the, any expectation that we want to compute becomes a nested integral over each of these individual terms. And that's easier than computing a D-dimensional interval. You just need to do them one by one. This is what it looks like. <coughs> uh, I illustrated the KL divergence in this one-dimensional case, saying that the support of Q needs to be within the support of B uh, in some reasonable manner. So what very small inference does because of this property is that it really tries to fit the approximation inside the true posterior to avoid putting significant amount of probability mass for any parameter values for which the data is very unlikely. Now oh, there is a theta missing, so this would need to be P of D given theta. What it means is that it kind of tends to underestimate the uncertainty in the posterior. This happens for, uh, already because of the KL divergence. <coughs> the fact that we are doing mean field approximation, meaning that our approximation here cannot model any correlations, it tends to make the issue worse. So you always have these kind of tails here that along any dimensions that correlate in the true posterior, 
there's going to be some probability mass here that our approximation cannot capture. This is just good to remember that this is happening. In most cases, it's not a very significant issue. You still get a very good approximation. It just means that if you report your variances, there's going to be some kind of final estimation going on. Uh, for the mean field approximation, so our actual bound, the loss of the objective function that we're trying to maximize, becomes something <coughs> like this. So you have the expectation over the uh, lot likelihood of the data. It is this nested integral over all possible terms. The KL divergences between the approximation and the prior, those we can kind of separate from each other. We assume that they are independent, so it just becomes so we don't need to worry about the nested integration here. You can just take a look at one each of your parameters at a time and compute these uh, pair matrices. Most of the time I will not talk about any of the algorithms or any equations for this part. I assume that to be easy if we know how to handle it. So there's no multidimensional integrals of any kind uh, in this. Especially during tomorrow, I most of the time skip this term because it's, it's easy. And now we need, the goal is to optimize, maximize this objective value by selecting the best possible parameters for our uh, approximation. <coughs> Importantly, however, we did not yet define what are the actual parametric form of our distributions. I just said, we assume that it factorizes this way. The interesting thing is, which we'll show next, uh, that it actually we don't need to make any assumptions on the functional form, at least for specific kind of models. Instead, we will actually get a result that determines the functional form automatically, with something called the variational calculus, which is like where the variational approximation name comes from. So, Let's first of all take a small detour to talk about optimization algorithms. We will today, tomorrow, talk about stochastic gradient descent, which I presume most of you know about. Today we use much simpler optimization algorithm called coordinate ascent. Uh, who knows what a coordinate ascent is? Coordinate descent, would that be better? Just go into the opposite direction. Now, but it's a very simple algorithm. Uh, consider an objective of the dimensional parameter vector. You randomly select one parameter at a time. You optimize your objective function with respect to that parameter alone, keeping everything else fixed. This is what you do, for example, with k-means. You alternatingly optimize for the centroids, keeping the cluster allocations fixed, or you optimize for the cluster allocations, keeping the centroids fixed. This is a generalized case of coordinate ascent. You don't need to select them randomly, you just select somehow one parameter, optimize your objective function with respect to that, and keep everything else fixed. Uh, this is a very simple algorithm, but it's a very nice algorithm in the sense that solving optimization problems in one dimension is often much easier than in higher dimensions. You don't need to do gradient descent or anything here. Often you can do closed form analytic solutions or you can do line search along this dimension or whatever you think. But of course, it's still an iterative optimization algorithm converts it to some sort of a local optimal. You find it uh, Another thing, who knows about black mass multipliers? Good, that's much better. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go through this, I just mentioned this idea that the Laplace multiplier is a way of solving optimization problems, so we're maximizing some sort of function given a constraint uh, that it has to equal some value. Uh, what you do in practice is that you just add to your loss function or subtract from that some Laplace multiplier might multiply by the constraint, this constraint. And you solve for the gradient of this uh, Lagrange function being zero. That's simply looking for the extreme point of a function, but now with this augmented function. Uh, 
Most of you knew what this is about, so I'm not going to spend any time explaining the details. The key AI element is like this, this is from Wikipedia, so I forgot to add the source. The basic idea is that if we want to optimize the function along this line, at any point, we can project the gradient of the original loss function to this line and move along this projected gradient. Until at some point, the projection of the gradient of the original objective function is zero. So the gradient is perpendicular to the, to the constraint function. Or orthogonal to the constraint and perpendicular to the actual gradient of the objective, uh, the constraint function. So what it just means is that the gradient of the objective, a lot of actual objective has to be some scalar times the gradient of the constraint. And this is from there, if you move backwards, it kind of motivates why you need to buy this one. The key element is really that we can just add the constraint with some multiplier and then proceed as if there was no constraint. This is the only thing we need to pay for now. So, the question is, we did not specify what the functional form of these approximation terms is, but we know that they need to be distributions. So let's solve this optimization problem. This is our simply our actual evidence lower bound, being we're trying to maximize. Conditional on Q of theta D, so one of these Q terms being a probability distribution. So we add a constraint that the integral over the q has to be 1. So this is a function that evaluates to 0 whenever q is a distribution, and to something else if it's not. So it is exactly the kind of constraint that we need here. And then there is the Lagrange multiplier for that constraint. We don't know what its value is, we don't need to care about it, we just can write this function. So this is the kind of a Lagrangian for solving an optimization problem of what should q of theta d be to improve the bound as much as we can, <coughs> conditional on it being a distribution. Now that we are doing coordinate ascent, we are keeping every other term fixed, except for one of these q, q terms, we can just write this nested integral as an expectation over the Q of theta D, and then of an expectation that is already computed over all other terms in our approximation. They are some fixed probability distributions. We don't need to worry about what they are. At least on a level of equations, I can just write it there. So what we have is an objective function that looks like this. <coughs> So let's take a look at the terms here. What we have here is really the expected joint likelihood, already taken and computing the expectation over all other terms in our approximation. Then we have the entropy term for this, this particular Q. And then we have uh, alpha times Q, uh, well, let's say. This comes, so, so there is a Q time, there's just an integral over Q multiplied by alpha, and then this is the kind of constraint that it has to become 1, and it was multiplied by alpha, so it appears here, outside the integral. So this is our Lagrangian for solving this optimization problem. And like I said, with uh, Lagrangian, we just take derivative with respect to the parameter and set it to zero. This is where we find an extreme of this objective function. Uh, I'm not going to bother you about the details of functional derivatives, just saying that we can just as well compute the derivative of this kind of an expression with respect to the function. It's not a, a derivative with respect to a parameter, a derivative with respect to a function. Uh, if you're a mathematician, you might want to figure out uh, are we in a situation where this can be done? Yes, it can. Uh, if you're not a mathematician, just think of Q as a parameter. So you could discretize it very densely and think of it as a long parameter vector and then it would be natural that to take the derivative with respect to that parameter vector. All the math for this kind of functional derivatives goes in this simple case as if we were doing regular derivatives. So let's take a look at what happens if we take a derivative of this function with respect to Q of theta. 
The first thing is that there is an integral of q of integral of q of eta times this expectation. If we take derivative of that uh, with respect to q of theta, what remains is this expectation itself. It's just q times something that is not a function of q. Uh, similar q times log q, we get, if we do the derivative with respect to the first appearance of q, we get log q. Uh, and here this, this is just the integral of q multiplied by alpha derivative with respect to q is just alpha. Then what we have is here, we have this q log q. The derivative of that is log q plus q divided by q. Uh, some kind of product rule of differentiation, which is of course that happens to be exactly one. It's a constant, it doesn't matter what it is, but it appears there. And now we solve for when is this derivative zero? We just rearrange the terms. We get an expression that says log of q of theta d is this. There is an expression that solves analytically for an optimal choice of what the distribution needs to be, just by simple standard, kind of, not very standard, it's functional derivatives and so on, but a very simple manipulation in general. C, we don't know what the value of C is, but it doesn't depend on the D. That's the important thing. It's a normalization constant of some sort, so what we get in the end is that we have a closed form expression of q of d that d has to be proportional, so it's proportional to, because we are ignoring the c, proportional to the e to the power of the expected log likelihood integrated over all other terms in our <coughs> It's a bit maybe tedious derivation to go through. You don't need to understand all the details of it. The important thing is that uh, what we did was that we realized that the coordinate ascent over a mean field approximation, so an approximation that factorizes over the individual terms, we can solve for analytically that what is the optimal distribution for any one of these terms, conditional on all others being fixed. And we didn't assume what is the distribution of family or anything. We just said that we can compute it like this. What it means in practice is that if all the other terms are fixed, then this actually ends up determining the parametric family as well. This belongs, this is some pro specific probability distribution. We don't know yet what it would be, but it is still uh, determined by the knowledge of all the other. The practical question, of course, is how do we compute this? This is a simple and <coughs> elegant expression saying that this, any given one factor of this approximation has to look like this. Now, yes, the proportional constraint is missing here. Uh, and this is where the exponential family gets back to the question. Uh, it helped us a lot. We can write down the, exp the posterior of a model with conjugate minors in a closed form without needing to worry about any of these details. It will help us similarly with various non approximations. As long as we have a model with nice conjugate priors, so priors that are conjugate to the specific likelihoods that we use, I will simply tell you that the Functional form of the variational approximation is going to be same, the same as it is for the prior. It's not obvious why this is the case, but it just holds. In a similar manner that I mean that for actual posterior is of the same functional family, the approximating factor will also be of the same family. <coughs> What I'm going to do next is, I will actually show you that if you take this for granted, then I tell you how you can derive a practical variational approximation algorithm using this regular normal parameterization of whatever distributions you want to. 
I'm just relying on this knowledge that the positive factors are going to be of the same specific family as your prior square. <coughs> but of course, I will later show that in the exponential family, you can just write all these very compact notations uh, in general. So let's really go through an example. Uh, this is a simplified linear regression, not really a proper model. You would never use this in a, in a real example. So what it assumes is that you have covariance x, some uh, d-dimensional <coughs> uh, covariance, and then you have outputs y. And you're assuming that the probability distribution for y given x and the rate vector w and then some residual noise uh, parameterized by the precision of y, it's simply a normal distribution. So if you just stop here, you would do the least square fit, and you would get the kind of maximum likelihood solution for WDC. Then we assume a simple prior, that the parameter of the W is element-wise normal distribution with zero mean and some precision. So we are doing L2 regularization, essentially. And then we are saying that for the noise parameter, the noise precision, we assume a gamma prior. All our reasonable things to do, this is just not a very interesting model. There's a citation for a paper that goes through a slightly more justified choice of uh, linking tau y and this tau w to each other and so on. It makes much more sense that way. And now let's assume a factorized approximation, the mean field approximation. So we have this tau y. We just had to say that it has its own factor. And then we have the w. I'm now assuming that we have a multivariate distribution over W, that can have correlations. I do have also assume that I have a product of D one-dimensional marginals for every entry of a W. It turns out actually to complicate the equations, and I also wanted to demonstrate that the mean field doesn't necessarily need to be variable by variable. You can have multivariate distributions there, assuming they happen to fit with so this is simply a normal distribution with some mean and some precision matrix. D times D matrix and D times D element regular. And to fit the approximation, what we need is a rule for updating this Q of W and the rule of updating for Q of tau Y and then the group equations for computing the actual order. So these three elements we simply need to be right. Let's do that. If we start with the Q of W, the only thing we... I actually go back here and just show it. Uh, so this is the equation we want to compute. It's the expect e to the power of expectation of the joint density over all other terms. So let's just write that. Uh, I've switched to the log domain to avoid this e to the power of something, but to keep the equations briefer. So it means that log of Q is Log of Q is simply the uh, expected joint likelihood of our model, the likelihood under prior. The failure where we are taking the expectation over the other term in our approximation. There is now only one, so it's the Q of tau. There would be all the other terms if we had a more complex model. And then you have the constant C. Uh, the next thing we do is we simply plug in the joint densities of all possible terms in our likelihood. So what we have here is this is y given x and w, the log <coughs> of a normal distribution. Uh, that should be say oh, yeah, right. And the same here to the log, doesn't matter. Uh, this is uh, D of W, and then the, this is the logarithm, logarithm density of a gamma distribution. If you don't remember what gamma, gamma DDF looks like, you no need to worry, it doesn't really matter too much. And now the next thing is that what we are really interested in is the integral of this thing over Q of tau, and we are looking for a distribution that is over W. So the important things are, first of all, we can drop every single term that doesn't depend on W. We can move it to the constant. 
It's a distribution over W. We don't worry about the normalization constant at all. And then due to linearity of uh, expectations, every single term that doesn't depend on how wide can be taken outside of the, uh, the expectation. So the only thing, so for example here, just get rid of all of these immediately. <coughs> they have no relationship to W. You can get rid of these. Uh, you can get rid of this. You can get rid of this. The only things that remain are these two things here. And furthermore, the only thing that remains within the expectation comes from here. Everything else goes outside the expectations. It's just regular manipulation, as if you would be deriving maximum likelihood solution for this, this model. It's tedious, but I mean it's this. Uh, that was for a single observation. I just wanted to write things in a more compact manner. So you have one y and one x. If you plug in a collection of n data points, uh, you need to, instead of a square, you need to have all the matrix uh, products and whatever. Uh, then we again need to start completing the squares to be able to derive a nice and elegant place for this. But what we see in the end, that this density, so the log of Q is this, corresponds to log of some multivariate normal distribution that happens to have these mean and value, these precision, precision and, and mean parameter. I'm not showing them here, they are a bit tedious derivations, uh, but what I am saying is that they are the same derivations you would have done if you were deriving the posterior of W conditional on your data and a fixed known value for 12y. The only difference being that here, instead of the known fixed value, we have the expectation of the whatever distribution we currently have for Q of tau. And because our term for Q of tau was some sort of a gamma distribution with parameters alpha and theta, we know that this expected value is actually given by alpha divided by theta. And that's a derivation for a single factor in this approximation. The next thing is to do the exact same thing for the other term. We need to learn an update rule for Q of tau. This time we integrate of our Q of W. Oh, I forgot to change this. Uh, the slides are available somewhere over there. I will upload an improved version uh, after the slides to the lectures. Too. And again, here it's missing some logs here. I need to fix this. The key elements being that it's the exact same expression. Now we ignore everything that doesn't depend on tau. Take everything that doesn't depend on W outside the expectation. And the only thing that uh, kind of remains, uh, here comes, this comes here, this comes here. <coughs> this doesn't matter. Uh, and then we have all the ones that are coming from the prior that this is and again, we recognize that this is a log of some gamma distribution where uh, <coughs> we just need to add something to the original prior. So if we had a, the prior parameters for our uh, model, then we just add one half for every data point that, that we observe, and then we have one half of the kind of squared error, but this time integrated over the posterior over the current approximation term. Again, <coughs> it's probably hard to follow this here, but the inter interesting thing is that, again, it's the exact same posterior that we would have for standard Bayesian linear regression. The only difference being that here we don't have the mean residual error, but we have the expectation. The expectation is now of this kind of a quadratic function. It's not a simple expectation of any of the W itself. 
So we need to do a bit of manipulation to see that in the end we actually need the mean value and we need the kind of this p times p uh, covariance matrix of the the expected second moment of this multivariate normal This unknown, so the mean is of course the mean parameter. This is a covariance matrix plus uh, an outer product of the means. These are things that you would find in, let's say, the matrix cookbook. But if you have a multivariate normal distribution, how do you compute specific kind of expectations of that? Rapidly use derivations, but it can be done. Finally, if we want to compute the actual bound, the bound is now an integral over all of our, the whole factorization of the joint density, I'm st and then still on top of that we have the entropies. I'm dropping the entropies. You know what is the entropy of a probability distribution. You can look in the Wikipedia or somewhere else to see what is the entropy of a normal distribution for some parameters, or what is the entropy of a gamma distribution. They exist in closed form. Then we have this nasty expectation where we again can drop. Uh, but now we cannot drop anything because we want to know the actual numerical value. It depends on the constant as well. But we can take out of the expectation all the terms that doesn't depend do, don't depend on the specific parameter. And then some new nasty things appear. For example, we need the expected value of a logarithm of, uh, of this Ly, which exists if you go look at how to compute the expected value of a logarithm of a gamma distributed variable is something that depends on the data function. So this can be done. There's no way that you could follow the derivations here. I think other than these small mistakes that I put here, the derivations are probably correct. Uh, or then I may sometimes call errors or something. The important thing is that these can all be computed by direct manipulation of things and then knowledge of how to compute specific kind of expectations. So this is what we have. If you make the mean field approximation, if you have a model with perfect priors, you can make closed form updates for individual terms of your approximation that look a lot like the conditional distributions of the actual underlying model, but you just need to compute certain expectations as part of this. And then we have the coordinate ascent algorithm that by iteratively doing this for every factor at a time for tens or hundreds or thousands of iterations, you keep on updating them every time and so on to convert to some sort of a uh, local optimum. The nasty thing is that the derivations are involved. I mean, you get a lot of manipulation of log PDFs. Uh, you need to compute some fair, some seemingly non-trivial expectations that, of course, someone else has done for you. You don't need to actually start from computing the expected value of a lot of the gamma distribution, but you still need to know which, how it can be done. But it's still a practical algorithm. This is what is behind majority of uh, various approximation papers in the machine learning literature, excluding the last few years. Let's say, if when I did something like a various approximation for canonical correlation analysis, this is essentially what we went through. Manual derivation of these update rules, it's a very boring technical exercise. That's why we have the PhD students to kind of do the derivations. <laughs> I've, I've, had, I've had people do master's thesis with 10 page or 15 page after disease, just going through this. <coughs> but you have to do go through them. Unless you switch to the exponential limit, <laughs> where things actually get easier. Uh, first of all, the fact that we actually, everything that we worked on looked like a conditional distribution, so the kind of actual or posterior, is not a coincidence. So instead of looking at some likelihood, we can just as well look at the log likelihood of a parameter conditional on everything else. Simply because this is not a function of theta. 
So what it means is that in practice, before doing what I did earlier, you could just be right essentially the git sampling updates. What is the conditional distribution of a parameter in your model, conditional or everything else, and the data. And then you just take expectations of these over all the approximation terms. And things get easy in the exponential family. So if your conditional, whatever the conditional distribution is, if it is in an exponential family, then we will get a very simple elegant update rule. Uh, there's no point in going into the details, so because these are written in a form that just says, I know that things are in an exponential family. I know that my natural parameter for this term has to be a function of everything else. I have no idea what the function is, but this is just a condensed representation. Then, then we can simplify our update rule into something that only depends on the expected value of these natural parameters. Uh, this gives you this very nice and compact notation, but it still doesn't save you from deriving what this conditional distribution is. It's just deriving it in a slightly different parameter process. Uh, this is particularly useful uh, for this kind of latent variable models, when you have some sort of a parameter, beta, let's say the mean vectors in a Gaussian mixture model, or something like this. And then you have n data points, and for each data point you have some sort of a latent variable. Let's say the cluster allocation of which cluster this data point comes to, goes to in a mixture model. Then, if you make the natural choice and write your uh, kind of approximation that you have some approximation for your parameters, parameterized by this lambda, and then you have for each individual latent variable you have your own factor with its own parameter psi i. It's, that's simply another parameter. Then, thanks to the general rule that we have for these exponential family conditionals, what you get is that for every local variable, you just make an independent optimization that looks at the expected value over the distribution that we have for the parameters of the natural parameters of the conditional that, of course, depend on the specific data point and then the parameter. Whereas for the parameters themselves, we actually know that it's going to be always a two-parameter uh, prior. So there is a, some sort of a prior for the natural parameters that depends on two parameters. For the latter one, you will simply be adding the number of, of, number of uh, data points and latent variables you had. And then for the first one, you sum up over the expected values of the sufficient statistics of the uh, uh, latent factors there. I don't go into any of the details here. The thing is that these look very much similar to what it would be the kind of update rules in for a kind of actual posterior uh, just have these expectations. This also leads us to something that I want to very briefly mention called stochastic variation first. Uh, because, so, if you think about what's been happening in, uh, in recent years, it's that all the time we get bigger with the data sets. We are now routinely, everything you do with, let's say, deep learning, you never ever look over the whole data set to compute the gradients, you just look into it over some sort of data batches. If you take a look at what's happening here, we, all the derivations we've done, assume full, complete knowledge of all the other approximating terms, including one for every latent variable that we have here. Uh, but already looking at this expression, we can see that, yes, you don't necessarily need to do that. You can update your global parameters, the approximation for the global parameters beta, based on a subsample of your data points and the corresponding uh, factors for the latent variables. Which is called stochastic variation on inference. The answer is very simple. So, 
if we are summing over all data points, so if you don't sum over all data points, but a smaller subset, you get a stochastic estimate of this quantity. The important thing is that you still here need to assume that you observe n data points. The more data you observe, the more your kind of posterior, the real posterior of eta condenses. So we need to take it into account here. So I will show you here the actual update rule. If you use just one data point to estimate this sum of the sufficient statistics, what you end up doing is that you end up with an update rule of something like this. The second parameter in this natural parameterization for the approximation for for the data parameter, it still increased as if they were in data points. Correspondingly, you have to multiply the expectation computed based on just one data point with n as well. This is a kind of a very technical, very low level thing that becomes apparent when we do the derivation. Uh, the derivation actually doesn't follow directly from here. So intuitively, you can hear already kind of guess that yes, I can subsample my data as long as I kind of multiply the effect back to the level of having observed n data points. In reality, the stochastic variation inference has to be first convert the problem into a stochastic optimization problem by looking at the gradients of our objective function with respect to this lambda parameter. It turns out but in exponential family, the gradient has a very, very simple and elegant form that only depends on the existing value and then the value we would have obtained if we want where to solve this coordinate ascent update rule. It's very convoluted, it's quite definitely not an obvious thing that why this happens. But thanks to this property, you can actually write various on inference assets, kind of stochastic <coughs> gradient descent, where you can very easily. But this, I think it's, it's, in some sense, it's a, if you look at the paper, it's uh, in JMLR uh, 2013, I guess I probably linked it here by Hoffman and others. It's a 20 to 30 page paper only to justify this very intuitive reasoning that it's obvious that you can hear subsample your data. Uh, it re requires all these natural gradient derivations and all of that. But I think for the purpose of what we're talking about here, it's just important to realize that we can optimize in this closed form analytic fashion that we are doing this year, we can switch to operating with subset of data points. You don't need to understand all the math behind it to be able to grasp that. <coughs> Um, uh, no, I don't think you would usually use just one sample. Uh, I think that's all. This 2013 kind of predates most of the current mini batch based optimization algorithms and so on. So the theoretical derivations, yeah, it's easiest to show that it holds for n equals 1. And then the generalization to mini batches is obvious. Uh, but yes, you would, of course, in practice. Practice use examples in most cases. Okay. Uh, finally, one thing uh, we're running a bit over time, but not really that much. Don't worry about the five slides still remaining, the last three are references. The important thing here uh, was that everything that I've showed up to this point is that we need to make the assumption of mean field approximation and conditionally contribute points. So all the possible conditional distributions need to have a suitable conjugate point. Moving outside this is difficult. Not impossible, but it's difficult. Uh, if you have a model where some of the conditional distributions doesn't have a suitable conjugate prior, then all the, irrespective of whether you do it in the exponential family or in the regular parameterization, these derivations that we are making here don't end up nice. So you don't get as a result something that looks like the density of a gamma distribution. 
Instead, it's an arbitrary function, and to create, we understand what distribution it is, you would need to find out the normalizing constant. That's not nice, you can't do that easily. So what in practice needs to be done is that you introduce further layers of lower bounding somewhere in your derivation to complicate your model somehow. A traditional one that actually predates much of the kind of this conjugate uh, variational approximation things by Jordan and Yarkola and others. Uh, it starts by looking for, this is an example just of how you can make a very simple model, something like logistic regression that doesn't have nice conjugacy here because of the sigmoid function. Uh, that already for that you can do several alternative things and none of them are easy. Uh, so what Jacob and others did was that you, they kind of lower bounded uh, the sigmoid function itself uh, so that there was a tuning parameter for every single data point. That if you have a data point that maps to a specific part of your sigmoid function, you write the lower bound for the sigmoid function. So I can actually probably so you have a sigmoid function that is going to statistic. W transpose x is fed to the sigmoid function and the output is the probability of y being of 1. Then if you have one data point that kind of maps somewhere around here, then they construct an approximation like this to the sigmoid function that actually is of the form of some sort of a quadratic function of the, the input itself with some parameters, and what you end up doing, so it's not a quadratic function in this space, it's a quadratic function in the log space, and what you end up needing to do is to alternate between optimizing for every single data point the parameter of fitting this approximation here, and then the rest of the model. You can get faster algorithms by using something called the burning bound, which is where you actually bound the negative log likelihood itself with some sort of a Taylor expansion, don't go into the details, there's a paper if you are interested. Uh, and recently, uh, 2013, people finally realized how to turn something like logistic regression into a conditionally conjugate model by augmenting it with a random variable that follows a newly invented polyatama distribution. That then suddenly ha happens to have portion and polyatama conditionals and so on. So it's a very elaborate modification you need to do for your original model to augment it in a way that allows you to derive this. Of course, once you've done that, you'll get both the various approximation and exact conditionals and everything out of it. Polyakama distribution is not a very nice one. I mean, it's a very complicated distribution in general. Okay, so that's actually everything I had for today. Uh, I intentionally concluded it by saying that things are hard. If you want to do anything else than these conditionally conditional models, um, because tomorrow we talk more about how to get rid of these uh, with modern tools. Uh, anyway, just to recap, so what we have is that very small approximation is minimizing tail divergence from an approximation to the exterior, <laughs> which in practice we convert into lower bounding the logarithmic marginal likelihood. You can only do this efficiently if you make the mean field approximation and you work with uh, models with conditionally conjugate, uh, conditional, uh, conditional distribution that have conjugate priors. If you do that, then coordinate asset algorithm gives you a very nice and elegant algorithm where you need to do a lot of derivations, but you still, everything is computed analytically uh, with known expectations of this distribution. Exponential planning is helpful a lot with compact notation. Uh, you need to understand the exponential families if you want to read many of the research papers written on this. Uh, but I'm not sure whether it will actually implement any of the models in that way. It usually might be easier to just work in terms of the kind of probability parameterizations that we are happy ourselves to interpret and provide our prior knowledge with. Uh, so, the core limitations of why this is not a universal uh, replacement for MCS. <laughs> One is that there's this fundamental property of under estimating uncertainty everywhere, and it's made much worse by this mere approximation. 
you get good approximations, but they don't really capture the tails of the probability. So if you want to put this in a nuclear power plant where you want to be really, really, really sure that you capture also the all the extreme events, no problem. The elbow is nice for miniature monitoring conversions, but you can't compare models or approximations according to the lower bounds. I will tomorrow I'll talk about something you can do instead, very briefly. <coughs> Moving outside these constraints in field approximations going to get models is very difficult, not impossible. So you can take a model that is going to get work for uh, one or two research papers in order to produce an algorithm that can extend it a bit. Uh, the problem is that all of these derivations are very slow, very error-prone, prone, and I would personally say waste of time. I myself wasted, I guess, months, uh, if not years, of my time computing these integrals on pen and paper uh, for things that we wouldn't necessarily need to do if we had any better tools to operate with this. And I still don't think that any of the equations in my papers are kind of exactly correct. Some log or some division by half or whatever is missing almost certainly. Like in these slides, I have a couple of these mistakes that I was able to spot already now when presenting and probably many more that I did not. So, in conclusion, I would say that it's a very, very elegant and nice, mathematically nice formulation. You don't need to assume anything about the functional forms or any data pop out of well formulated objective functions, but the practical value is a bit limited outside the simple models for which someone else has already derived the update rules. But tomorrow, we talk about ways of doing these models. Uh, Doing the same things for much wider family of models and approximations with various kinds of stochastic optimization. Thanks, that's all for today.